الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala May the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Now we're still in the, uh, in the blessed month of Muharram The beginning of the Islamic uh, Hijri The year in which the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrated from Mecca to al Madinah. Many things happened in this month We just witnessed the day of Ashura uh, just last week of course, you know that Ashura initially is a day that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fasted because he saw the Jews fasting in Al-Madinah. If I asked them, why are you fasting? They said, we fast because this is the day in which Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala saved Musa Alayhi Salam from Fir'aun and his army. We fasted as a form of gratitude. For Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, نحن حق بموسى منكم we have more right to Musa alayhi salam than you people. And he, we love him more. Musa alayhi salam is for us. His story is for us. It belongs to us before you people. For Nabi sallallahu alayhi salam, he commanded the companions to fast that day. And he also fasted it. And then he commanded that we oppose the Jews and we fast the day before or a day after. And so whatever a person does is permissible in that regard. But then also on the 10th of Ashura, uh, later on, many years after Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam, uh, this is in the 61, 61 year of the Hijrah. So after Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam's death by about 50 years uh, was the event of Maqtal al Hussein ibn Ali radiyallahu anhu, the martyrdom of al Hussein, who was the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That also happened on Ashura. And so we witness also these days uh, around the world as well those that uh, yani ascribe themselves to the Shia sect, whether they're here or anywhere else, especially in Iran, in Karbala, uh, which where Hussein was killed, uh, you find that uh, people would go around and uh, beating themselves, lashing themselves, bleeding themselves. Uh, all of this is because of regret that they had betrayed al Hussein radiallahu anhu. So they do it as a form of repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah azza wa jal, may Allah forgive us, for our betrayal of Al Hussein radiallahu an. Now, this entire story, inshallah ta'ala, this is what I wanted to bring to the lesson today. We wanted to speak about the martyrdom of Al Hussein ibn Ali radiallahu anhu. What is the story in that? And how should the believers respond and react to this? And, uh, masalan, the hitting of a person and bleeding yourself and so on. This is all against the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is no doubt that the death of Al Hussein radiallahu anhu was a calamity, was a musibah that happened and befell al-Islam al-Muslimin at the time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us that when a musibah occurs, that we say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbid that a person slap himself and rip his, uh, his shirt, this is haram. If that was haram, imagine then bleeding yourself and cutting yourself and cutting others and so on. How much more would that be haram and forbidden? And then yet, yani doing this every single year, year in, year out, it definitely becomes something that is extremely forbidden in Islam. Whereas Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he considered it a bid'ah. And there are some sects as well that celebrated this occasion of the death of uh, Al-Husayn radiallahu anhu. Inshallah ta'ala at the end of the lesson we'll explain uh, how the believer uh, and how the Muslim should respond to, to such an event. But let's begin inshallah ta'ala our lesson with the year 571 AD. And that was the year in which Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born. And we're not going to get into a lot of detail because it's going to be very difficult. But a very quick rundown so we can understand from the very beginning up until Maqtal al-Husayn radiallahu anhu, which is yani, translated as the martyrdom of al-Husayn. In 571 AD, that was the year in which Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born. Of course, you know, he was born in Mecca and he was born an orphan. And his mother took care of him until he reached the age of six. Then she died. Then he went into the care of his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. And uh, he took care of him until he was eight years old. So he took care of him for two years. Then his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, died. And then his uncle, Abu Talib, took care of him. Uh, he took care of him for quite a while until Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam became a man. 
and he was able to take care of himself. And then later on, he got married to Khadija radiallahu anha. And then at the age of 40, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became appointed the final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah azza wa jal, he sent the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to all of mankind. Of course, to the Arabs and to the non-Arabs, to the black and to the white, to the men, to the women. And this had never ever happened before to any prophet. Then the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he taught us about what made him special, he said that the prophets before me, they used to be sent to their people khasatan, especially to their people. So people around the globe weren't ordered to follow that kind of prophet until he got to them. وَبُعِثْتُ لِلنَّاسِ عَامَّةً When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a special case, he was the only prophet that was sent to all of mankind from the day he was sent and appointed as a messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this happened, Allah azza wa jal chose him as a messenger to all of mankind. And Allah azza wa jal chose for him companions that believed in him and supported him and aided him. And he remained in Mecca for 13 years preaching to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah Azza wa Jal commanded him to migrate to Al Madinah after things became really difficult in Mecca. And he migrated to Al Madinah. He migrated to the people of Al Ansar. Well, Ansar are the people, the residents of Al Madinah that took care of the Prophet. Allah Azza wa Jal says about Al Ansar, يعني, great ayah in which Allah Azza wa Jal praised the people of Al-Ansar. Allah Azza wa Jal, he said about them, and those who settled in al Madina and adopted Al-Iman before them, meaning Al-Ansar were people that accepted Islam way before the Muhajirin. And the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to visit them in, uh, in their tents in Mina. When the people of Al-Ansar, the people of Al-Madina used to go to Mecca, they used to perform the Hajj. But يعني, at the very early stage of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi being appointed a messenger. And then this is where Bay'at Al-Aqab Al-Ula or Bay'at Al-Aqab al happened. And this is where the people accepted Islam. These were the people of Al-Madina. And then they went back to their homes in Al-Madina when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sends uh, يعني, uh, 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 يعني one of the companions uh, عنه, with them so that he teaches them Islam. So the people of Al Madinah accepted Islam way before the Muhajirin that were in Mecca. Wallah Azza wa Jal, he says about them in the Quran, Yuhibbuna man hajara ilayhim. They, they had incredible love and they had incredible respect and incredible honor for those who migrated to them, which were Al Muhajirin. For Allah Azza wa Jal, he spoke highly about Al Ansar in the Quran. So at this point, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, now he lives in Al-Madinah among two of the greatest tribes that ever walked the face of this earth, Al-Muhajirin wal Ansar. And uh, يعني, the love they had for him was more than the love they had for themselves. And they defended him with their bodies, with their souls, with their families, with their wealth, with everything they owned. And this was the case for 10 years. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Al-yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum, that today I have completed the religion, what deen is finished, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has fulfilled his task on earth in 23 years by delivering the final message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to mankind. And then during the 11th year of Al-Hijrah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam away from this life. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had left such a powerful generation, the companions, such a powerful generation he left behind him, that they're so powerful, or so incredible, that up until this day, we look, up, we look up to them, and we take them as our role models, and we read their seerah, and we research their seerah, and we preach their seerah, up until this day, this is only a sign that they were a, an incredible, powerful generation that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took great care of and he nourished. Yani, these are people that believed in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they fought for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake and they carried the deen after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they preached it and they carried the best of manners as well and they also spread that up until the Islam reached yani, all around the world. After the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he became the Khalifa of al Muslimin, And that lasted for two months and three years. Many things were achieved. People lived good times during his rule. 
And then يعني, he died radiyallahu anhu from a sickness that befell him. And then after this, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu became the Khalifa. He became a Khalifa for, for 10 years, Umar radiyallahu anhu. And uh, يعني, the Muslims lived a good time under his rule. Uh, a lot of things also were achieved in his time until at the end of his life, he was fatally killed uh, from a Majusi by known as Abu Lu'lah al-Majusi. He stabbed him with a knife as he was praying Salat al-Fajr. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu, he dies after this. And then the bay'ah was given to Uthman radiyallahu anhu. With Uthman, it lasted for 12 years and a few months as well. And uh, this was during the 32nd year of Al-Hijrah, 32 Al-Hijrah. Well, Muslims also lived يعني, peacefully in a good time under the rule of Uthman radiyallahu <laughs> anhu. Al-Jihad was happening. Al-Futuhat, conquering of the lands. Islam was brought to Africa at the time of Uthman radiyallahu anhu. Islam spread in Africa. Allahu Akbar. A lot of things were happening under the, and, يعني, for the Muslims during the time of Uthman radiyallahu anhu. He gathered the Quran, the people on one Quran and so on. But now we need to understand something before we speak about his death and what led to the death of Uthman radiallahu anhu. And this is where things are going to start going downhill. Uh, Uthman radiallahu anhu, يعني, do you know, I'm not sure if you know, but in, in a, a seerah, in the history, they speak uh, some things that يعني, Uthman radiallahu anhu is criticized for. But they are actually not criticisms. At the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu, towards the end of his rule, to end towards the end of his khilafah, the Muslims, there are Muslims around now because a lot of the, the countries have accepted Islam, a lot of the provinces have entered into Islam. So you have Al-Basra, you have Al-Kufa, this is Iraq, known as Iraq today. They are two cities within Iraq, but there were two provinces at the time. And you also have Egypt, they have accepted Islam as well. Some of the people, some people from Egypt and some people from Al-Kufa and some people from Al-Basra, uh, they really had something against Uthman radiallahu anhu and they didn't like certain things he was doing, doing during his life. This is what's going to lead to his kill. So what did they have? There's these people, <coughs> Al-Khawarij. They had certain things against him. Number one, Tawallihi aqaribahu. They criticized him for the fact that he appointed governors from his own relatives. And this had never happened before. So how come you are يعني, putting certain people from your own relatives into these positions? And it kind of seems to be that you have some kind of hand in this. And you're the one that is giving him these positions for your own benefit and for your own sake. And this is absolutely wrong. Because the people that he put in power and in position, and they were five of his relatives. And there were so many others that he put in position that were not of his relatives. And if this was a criticism that the people counted against him, then it should be a criticism counted against Ali radiallahu anhu. Because he also did the same thing. When he came into Khilafah, and he was there for, for a few years, for about six years, he did the same thing and he installed in certain positions some of his relatives. So in other words, it wasn't a criticism against Ali radiallahu anhu. And as a result, it surely does not count as a criticism against Uthman radiallahu anhu. Especially, because we don't have time to do this, but if you were to look into the seerah of each and every single one of his relatives that was installed in certain positions, you'd find that they were absolutely right for the job. And it wasn't like, Allah, whoever, just give him a position because he's from my family. And then that's the first thing that they criticized him for, and they had no right to criticize him for it. Number two, they criticized him for the fact that he burned all the masahif and he gathered the people on one Qur'an. Once again, this is not counted as a criticism. They did count it as a criticism. These people from Egypt, Ul Kufa, Ul Basra, we'll see what they're going to do at the end. But we're going to say and share straight away from now in defense of Uthman radiallahu anhu, not only in his defense, but in defense of the truth and what was right. Uthman radiallahu anhu, one of the companions, he came to him and he said, Ya Uthman, the people are about to commit kufr. The Quran is all over the place. Everyone has a different copy of the Quran. And when the believers were meeting in Mecca for the Hajj, they used to recite the Quran to each other. Hada is reading something different. This guy is reading the ayat differently. You know, there's the idea of the Qiraat, the different recitations in the Quran. But some companions, yani, Al-Hajj, it gathers everyone from all around the world, the Muslims. For some people never heard this recitation before. 
and, uh, and, and others didn't hear some other recitations and they're reading to each other, لا, they are wrong. Well, Quran is like this and the ayah is like this. For this uh, matter was raised to Uthman radiallahu anhu. Quickly, you've got to do something about it. People are going to kill each other about it. So he burnt all the copies of the Mus'haf. He burnt them all and he wrote one final copy. And he put in this one copy, he, uh, one copy, he accommodated in this one copy all the recitations of the Quran. So now the Mus'haf that we have, it accommodates for all the 10 recitations. You'll find that, يعني, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawmiddin, you know, there's another recitation, Maliki. That's why in the Mus'haf, you will not see Meme, Alif, Lam, Kaf, which is Maliki. You'll see Meme, Lam, Kaf, and a small Alif between the Meme and the Lam that accommodates for Maliki, and then also you can read it, Maliki Yawmiddin. So he did an incredible, powerful thing. <laughs> And they criticized him for that. How did you burn the Masahif? Let's keep going. These are all things that are going to lead to his death. They also accused him of hitting Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu until he busted his intestines and he killed him. And they accused him that he also severely beat Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu anhu until he broke his rib bones. And that's a lie. That never happened. They accused him of al-itmam of his safar. Uthman radiallahu anhu was known about him that he used to shorten the, the prayer when he used to travel. Then later on, he began to complete the prayer four rak'at. So he used to go from Mecca, from Al Madina to Mecca. Instead of praying Al Dhuhr two rak'at, he used to pray it four rak'at. So the people said, well, Why? Why has he began to change the deen of Allah? Now there are reasons for that. Number one, it is said that he got married to a woman from Mecca. So as a result, now he considered Mecca his hometown. So when he traveled to Mecca, he started praying four rak'at, which is now normal. And other opinions would suggest that when he went to Mecca, the people that were with him, because Allah had accepted Islam, he did not want to teach them that Salat al-Dhuhr is two rak'at. These people still don't know what the difference between the traveler's prayer is and the resident's prayer is. So he prayed the, the prayers four rak'at. And even when he did that, it's not something that is haram. It is, he left something that is best to something that is less best. In that opinion, if we said that he had people like this with him and he wanted to teach them that the prayer is for rak'at, Aisha radiallahu anha used to do the same thing as well. And as a result, this is his own personal ishtihad. One should not criticize Uthman radiallahu anhu for this. So as a result, they do not have any right in doing so, but they criticized him for that. Shuf, these things are building up bit by bit. You're going to see eventually the anger they had against him and that's going to lead to his death. So then they also criticized him عن غزوتي بدر. During the battle of Badr, he wasn't present. They said, ah, why is he Khalifa al Muslimin? The battle of Badr he didn't even attend. Well, the reason for this was because his wife, which was the daughter of Rasulullah وسلم, was sick at the time. For Nabi وسلم, gave him permission and told him remain at home Yani in, in treatment of your wife and stay right beside her. So therefore he did not attend the battle of Badr when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam promised him that he will earn the reward of those who yani joined the battle of Badr. طيب, another thing that they counted against him was Al-Firar min Ma'rakati Uhud. That on the battle of Uhud, a lot of the Sahaba, when everything was going downhill and the rumors spread that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got killed, 70 of the companions got killed, he and many other companions, they dropped their weapons and they ran away. Of course, this is considered a major sin. At-tawalli yawma, yawma zahf This is considered a major sin. Uthman radiallahu anhu was from among them. He dropped his weapons and he ran away and they all ran and they went to al uh, they went to al Madina, Back to al Madina. They left Uhud. Okay, but Allah Azza wa Jal said regarding that in the Quran, in Surah Ali Imran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ تَوَلَّوْا مِنْكُمْ يَوْمَ الْتَقَى الْجَمْعَانِ إنما استزلهم الشيطان ببعض ما كسبوا ولقد عفى الله عنهم الله عز وجل had forgiven them فيعني their forgiveness had already come down in the Quran straight after this battle of Uhud and Alhamdulillah everyone that ran away from the battle that kind of major sin was wiped away from his record Allah عز وجل had forgiven them so why are you criticizing him of something that Allah عز وجل had already forgiven him طيب the other thing is they criticized him غيابهو, عن بيعات الرضوان. You know, there was a bay'ah that happened to Rasulullah under the tree. Uh, يعني, in, in close to Mecca, when the Nabi went to Mecca and he wanted only to perform Umrah. 
So the uh, Quraysh, they barred him, they stopped him, they did not allow him. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent, listen, Uthman ibn Affan radiyallahu anhu. He sent him to go inside to Mecca and sign a treaty, Sulh al-Hudaybiyah it's called. So news came from Mecca that the Meccans Quraysh had killed Uthman radiyallahu anhu. So at that moment, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took his hand out and he said, this is the hand of Uthman. Give me bay'ah right now that we're going to avenge the blood of Uthman radiyallahu anhu. So this was called bay'atul ridwan. It happened under the tree. Allah azza wa jalla said, لَقَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ يُبَيْعُونَكَ تَحْتَ الشَّجَرَةِ So these people, they counted as a criticism against him that he did he wasn't present for bay'at al-ridwan. Well, how silly. How can he be present for bay'at al-ridwan when he was in Mecca? And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had sent him for a much greater mission, right? فَإِذَا This cannot be counted as a criticism against him. He was inside of Mecca, therefore he was not present for bay'at al-ridwan. And uh, finally, one last thing they counted against him. A few more things, but these are the majority ones. Ziyadatul uh, Adhani Athani Yawm Al Jumu'ah. They said that he caused the bid'ah in Islam and that he made a second adhan for Salat Al Jumu'ah. And it has always been in the lifetime of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Bakr, or Umar radiallahu anhuma, it's always been one adhan for Salat Al Jumu'ah. Now he came in and he introduced the second adhan. So they counted this as a criticism against him. And in reality, it is actually not a criticism against him. Number one, Allah and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnati al khulafai al rashidin. Hold on to my sunnah and hold on to the sunnah of al khulafa. And there's no doubt that Uthman radiallahu anhu was the third of the khulafa radiallahu anhu majma'in. Tayyib, so as a result, he introduced the second adhan because by now, Al Madina became populated with Muslims and they needed like a kind of alarm to tell them that Salat al Jumu'ah is approaching. So he introduced the second adhan for Salat al-Jum'ah. And what he did had essence in Islam because Salat al-Fajr has always been with two adhans. So it wasn't like something new. He just got the concept of Salat al-Jum'ah and the purpose of two adhans was to wake the people up and to warn them that adhan is going to happen very soon. So get ready and stop eating and stop drinking and so on. And so now, if we introduce the second adhan for Salat al-Jum'ah, it's going to fulfill the same purpose in which we're going to notify the people that close down your businesses and come towards al masjid for Salat al-Jum'ah. That's exactly what he did. So actually this is counted as one of the good qualities and one of the good things during his life. And the believers up until this day practiced this sunnah. In other words, the entire Muslim ummah agreed to it. But these people, certain people from uh, Masr and from Al-Kufa and from uh, Al-Basra didn't settle with this. They did not accept it whatsoever. So now we're towards the end of <coughs> Dhul Qa'dah, towards the end of Dhul Qa'dah. 6,000 people, and they were well-equipped soldiers, came from Masr and from al Kufa and Basra, and they went towards al Madina. They showed that they wanted to go to al Madina to join the believers in al Madina and then go to Mecca to perform Al-Hajj because we're towards the end of Dhul uh, Qa'dah. So Al-Hajj is about to happen soon. But in reality, 6,000, an army of 6,000 actually came and they wanted to kill Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. At the very beginning, they just wanted to remove him from the Khilafah, that position. So they got to al Madina. If they got in a good time. By then, the believers and the, most of the companions had went for Hajj. And there was only 600 companions in al Madina. What's 600 going to do in front of 6,000 that came for intention of war? For they came and they encircled the house of Uthman radiallahu anhu and they said to him, get up. وَعْزِلْ نَفْسَكَ عَنِ الْحُكْبِ وَعَنِ الْخِلَافَةِ Yalla, the, يعني, get rid of this position, give up the position and leave. You're not worthy of it anymore. And they began to count his criticisms and so on. For Uthman radiallahu anhu, he remained in his house. You know, of course, يعني, you, you could just imagine, and why would he stay? He stayed in his house 10 days and they encircled his house 10 days. People back then, they used to have respect. Yani they did not just open the door and barge into someone's house because the family and so on are there. Sure, subhanAllah, on one level they have that respect. And on the other level, yani this is Uthman radiallahu anhu, where's your respect for him? And how are you going, how dare you come with an intention to kill Khalifa al muslimin So anyway, they encircled his house. Some of the companions that were still in Medina entered upon Uthman. Tell us, what do you want us to do? If you want, we'll fight. We'll fight for you. And we'll, يعني, we'll bring out our children and we'll fight for you. 
Uthman radiallahu anhu, he says, everyone that has given me bay'ah, drop your weapons. I don't want any war and no fighting. Uthman radiallahu anhu realized, if a war is going to happen, maybe the entire city of Al-Madinah is gone and the children will be killed and the houses would be stolen and the wealth. For he didn't want this entire chaos. He knew 600 won't do anything against 6,000. So he refrained and he refrained up until towards the end, one of the companions, he said to him, uh, he said, Uthman uh, was thinking, should I leave the Khilafah? And I'll say, okay, khalas, I step down. So one of the companions, Umar, uh, Abdullah bin Umar, he said, don't do that. Because if you do that, what? how long are you going to live after that? You're going to live forever? If you left the hukum, stay there. Stay in that position. Because if you leave it, I fee that every single time some of the believers, no, they dislike their Khalifa, they'll turn against him and they'll bring him down. So stay where you are and teach people after you a lesson that you will fight and you will remain in your position because you're rightfully doing so. Stay in there until they kill you or until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees otherwise. Anhu, he took by that advice and he remained in his house. Eventually, uh, يعني, as he came out, they came towards him and they killed him radiallahu anhu and he died. And يعني, it was narrated that he was killed in his house. They came from the top and they entered into his house and they killed him radiallahu anhu wa arda. Hatta subhanallah to understand how loved Uthman radiallahu anhu was to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was a man, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yani once he was sitting in his house and his thigh was uncovered. Fa Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu came in when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sat as he is. Wa Umar radiallahu anhu came in when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sat as he is. His thigh was uncovered. Then a knock on the door. Who is it? Uthman radiallahu anhu. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam quickly got up and he covered his thigh. Fa Aisha radiallahu anhu. She said, Ya Rasulullah, Abu Bakr or Umar came in. You didn't do that. Uthman came in and you did that. For he said, Rabbi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ala astahi min rajul, tastahi minhu al-malaika. Should I not be shy from a man that the angels are shy of? Rabbi Allahu anhu arda. He was loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by the companions of and by the believers. The one who does not love him becomes a munafiq. For uh, Uthman radi Allahu anhu, he got killed. Hatta yani, to, to one of the stories, there was one man uh, yani he was one of those that was caught up in this criticism against Uthman and one of those that began to hate on Uthman during the end of his Khilafah when this kind of word was beginning to circulate in the Muslim world. But this man, he went, he was in Mecca once and he was doing uh, tawaf around the Kaaba. Well, Hassan al-Basri radiallahu anhu, he saw this man. And this man was saying, Allahumma ghfir li wa in kuntu a'lamu annaka la taghfiru li. He was making a weird dua. He's saying, oh Allah, forgive me. And I know that you will not forgive me. Fal Hassan al Basri said to him, What's this dua? I've never heard anyone make this dua. He said to him, Let me tell you the story. He said, I had, I had something against Uthman. This is now years after Uthman's death. But he's saying, I was one of those who got caught up in that scandal against Uthman. Radiallahu anhu. And I had promised Allah that if I see Uthman, I will go slap him on his face. I was going to do that. So when I heard the news of his death, I got happy. And I went to al Madinah. I was there. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were entering the house of Uthman one by one. And they were praying upon him in the house, just like they did to Rasulullah sallallahu So I made myself, I made myself one of those that are concerned. And I entered the house and I made myself like I'm praying on him. And I seen him and his face was covered. So I uncovered his face and I slapped him. And then he said, فَيَبَّسَتْ يَدِي مِنْ ذَاكَ my hand became frozen from that day. When Hassan al-Basra looked at him and he had seen his hand, it was frozen. He couldn't move it. Fa, yani, this is why he was making this dua, Allah forgive me. And I know that you might not forgive me because his hand was still, yani, yani, it was disabled, it was paralyzed, it was frozen in the same position it was from the moment he slapped yani, Uthman radiallahu anhu's face. For a man that was Waliullah, a friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah azza wa had defended Uthman radiallahu anhu. <coughs> When this man <coughs> yani, tried to <coughs> harm him in that manner, Wallahu alam. So Uthman radiallahu anhu, he dies. Of course, you know, things are going to start going downhill. There are people that killed Uthman. Uh, these people are known. They ran away. Yani, 6,000. Who are you going to follow? And how are you going to avenge the blood of Uthman? It's 6,000. Even though the, lead, the leaders and the heads of this kind of plan were six, and they were known, 
but still the Muslims could not get to them. So after Uthman radiallahu anhu, uh, Talha was Zubair or Aisha radiallahu anhu, they were all in Mecca and they were asked, who should we give the bay'ah to? And they all said, alaykum bi Ali, give Ali the bay'ah. Even Aisha radiallahu anhu said, alaykum bi Ali. Well, Talha was Zubair, they become very important for our story later on, but they also said, Khalas, they told the people and they advised them, give bay'ah to Ali. So then Ali radiallahu anhu was given the bay'ah. <clears throat> Ali radiallahu anhu lived in Al-Madina at the time with his family. They gave him al-bay'ah. He became Khalifa to muslimin His Khilafah lasted for six years. But what had happened is when he was given the bay'ah, you had Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan radiallahu anhu from among the companions where he was in Asham. Now, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan is related to Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. So he can understand that he's now enraged and he's angry at the fact that his relative, which is Khalifa al-Muslimin Uthman radiallahu anhu, has been killed in an oppressive manner. So Muawiyah radiallahu anhu is told that Ali radiallahu anhu is now the Khalifa and give him the bay'ah. He refused. Muawiyah refused. And he did not refuse because he wants to be the Khalifa. He refused because he wants to avenge the blood of Uthman right now. Once we do it, give me those who killed Uthman. And some of them now were in the army and they called them Shia to Ali. They were in the army of Ali radiallahu anhu. Back then, Shia as an ideology did not exist yet. It only existed as a political movement. They were with Ali radiallahu anhu. <clears throat> so Muawiyah radiallahu anhu he refuses. And the only difference between Muawiyah and Ali, the big difference between them was not, I want to be Khalifa, you want to be Khalifa. It's known that Ali radiallahu anhu is going to be the Khalifa. The only difference is that Ali is saying, oh Muawiyah, not now. We cannot avenge the blood of Uthman right now. There's no, we cannot do it now. We'll do it, but later. Ali is saying later. Muawiyah is saying that it's supposed to happen right now. And therefore, يعني, this happened as a problem. So Talha was Zubair and Aisha radiallahu anhum ajma'in, they're in Mecca. So they leave from Mecca and they head towards Al-Kufa with an army. Why? Because they know that the, the leaders of the plan of the assassination of Uthman radiallahu anhu live in Al-Kufa. So they went with an army towards Al-Kufa. And they did not tell Ali radiallahu anhu because they thought Ali would not, you know, actually he would commit this kind of plan and go ahead. They did not think that Ali radiallahu anhu would oppose them. So Talha was Zubair radiallahu anhu, Aisha radiallahu anha, they left from Mecca with an army of 10,000 and they left until they got to Al-Kufa. Ali radiallahu anhu heard of the news, so he came as well. And the two, and he came with an army from al Madina, and both of them met in a place known as Waqatul Jamal Al-Ula. Al-Jamal Al-Ula, right? This is the first battle that happened, Muslims against the Muslims. <laughs> Even though in essence, it did not begin as a battle. When they first both arrived, Talha was Zubair, they went and they had negotiated and spoke to Ali radiallahu anhu. Things were sorted out. And so they slept that night. Two armies. They came يعني, with the intention, Talha was Zubair coming in the intention of attacking Al-Kufa and those who were responsible for the death of Uthman. Wa Ali radiallahu anhu, then he comes to stop all that. So there was no intention to kill each other. For they slept that night and those people that were responsible for the death of Uthman during the night they came and they penetrated the lines of the Muslims and they began to kill certain people. Fa subhanallah Talha was Zubair thought that Ali radiallahu anhu's army is attacking them. Wa Ali radiallahu anhu thought that Talha was Zubair's army is attacking them. And so a war begins. And you know when the war begins you cannot stop it. As يعني, uh, some of the shu'ara, the poets of Islam would mention in their poetry that once a war begins and it's fierce and the swords are going left and right, who's going to come and say, stop, stop? They, 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 none of this. So it continued. It continued until towards يعني, Salat al-Maghrib. <clears throat> All of the companions were killed. Radiyallahu anhu majma'een. To show you that Ali radiyallahu anhu did not want this. In that battle, Talha radiyallahu anhu was killed. He was martyred. Where um, also a Zubair radiallahu anhu was killed with a stray arrow from his army that went and killed him. But when Talha radiallahu anhu died, uh, Ali radiallahu anhu he walked past his body and he began to cry. He began to cry, yani in regret. What has happened? He said, 
ذاك سيف لطالما دافع عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. He looked at Talha and the sword next to Talha and he began to cry and he said this is a sword that used to defend the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How did the matter get to this in where now Muslims are responsible for his death and I'm stuck in between this? And he said, Laytani mittu qablaha ishroor asana. I wish I had died before all these 20 years. This is Ali radiallahu anhu speaking. So eventually, um, Aisha radiallahu anha, she was on her camel and her camel got killed and it fell. And the couch stage, which is a holder, it's a house that they put on the camel and where women sit in it, it fell. Once that happened, everyone stopped and took the matter seriously. This is Ummul Mu'mineen, Aisha radiallahu anha. She had, did she die? But what, what happened? They realized that she was alive. So Ali radiallahu anhu, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam had told him during his life, he said to him, Ya Ali, something will happen between you and Aisha. Something will happen. Shuf Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam prophesizing. And he said to him, when something happens, farfaq biha. Be, uh, be careful with her. You know, be generous and take care of her when something happens. For Ali radiallahu anhu, he says, would I be the fault? Would I be a culprit in it? Would I be a perpetrator in any kind of harm at that time? For Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he said to him, no, you're not upon any evil at that time. But when it happens, just take care of her. Well, subhanallah, it unfolds before Ali radiallahu anhu. So he يعني, commands that Aisha radiallahu anha is taken safely back to al Madina, and he sends an army with her and they take her to al Madina. Now, <clears throat> the war is over. Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, يعني, he's still in Asham. Uh, he's the governor of Asham. He was then installed by Uthman radiallahu anhu during that time. So since then, he hasn't come down from that position. And Ali radiallahu anhu now decides to move to Al Kufa. So he lives there with his children. He doesn't go to Al Madinah anymore. He lives there. Years go by, subhanallah, we begin to find out bit by bit that the people of Al Kufa, the people of Al Kufa up until this day, were the people of Ahlu Ghadrin wa Khiyana. These were people that betrayed Ali radiallahu anhu. These were people that had no respect, they had no honor, they had no dignity. <clears throat> you know, when you called them to war and to go to war, they'd say yes, yes. And then when the army would say to them, look, just remain home and we'll give you money, we'll give you gifts. Okay, no worries. That's it. We won't fight anymore. This, this is how they were. The uh, dunya would basically dictate these people's lives, the people of Al-Kufa. Eventually, in Mecca, there were three men. People from Al-Kufa, Wal-Basra, and Egypt. They came together and they said, you know what? The Muslims are in a big mess. And the leaders and the responsible for the Muslims at mess is Ali radiallahu anhu. Or Muawiyah in Asham, or Amr ibn al As in Egypt. Let's kill all three of them and maybe then things will settle. Three from the Khawarij. Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim is one of them and two others. So Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim from Mecca, he said, I'll take on Ali, I'll kill him. Someone else said, I'll take on Muawiyah. And the third one said, I'll take on Amr ibn al As. Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim, he heads towards Al Kufa. As Ali radiallahu anhu is coming out of his house, this is now the sixth year of his khilafah, it's finishing off his khilafah. He came out of his house going towards al masjid to pray Salat al Fajr. Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim, he had a dagger with him, a knife that he had been, uh, 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 he had dipped it in poison and kept it there for Jum'atan, a, a week. So you can just imagine it's fully poisoned. And he went and he stabbed Ali radiallahu anhu during the, يعني, his walk to Salat al Fajr. And Ali radiallahu anhu was martyred there and he was killed by this Khawariji, by this Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim. The other one, he went to Asham and he found Muawiyah. He stabbed him, he tried to assassinate him, but Muawiyah radiallahu anhu lived. However, after this, he wasn't able to have children, but he lived radiallahu anhu and they killed the one that came to assassinate him. And the third one in, uh, in Egypt that went to kill Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu, that day Amr ibn al-As was sick. So he stayed at home. Shuf, the attacks are always at Salat al-Fajr. So he stayed sick at home and he had sent someone else as an imam to replace him. Fa-miskeen, rahimahullah, that person, he got stabbed instead of Amr ibn al-As. And the people said to him, what are you doing? He said, qataltu Amr ibn al-As and I'm resting the Muslims from this person. They said to him, no, you silly, you did not kill Amr, Amr ibn al-As. You killed someone else that came to replace him for today and he is sick. So they grabbed this person and all three of them were killed. Those that يعني, tried to assassinate and kill these governors, they were all killed for radiallahu an Ali. He was killed at that time. And that was the end of 
the rule of Ali radiallahu anhu, and that was six years and a few months. After this, <coughs> the people of Al-Kufa now gave bay'ah to Al-Hasan, which is the son of Ali radiallahu anhu. Then, as I said to you, his family was all in Al-Kufa. So they gave bay'ah to Al-Hasan radiallahu anhu, and his bay'ah lasted, uh, his, his khilafah lasted for six months. Al-Bay'ah happened, and still there was this big chaos between Al-Hasan now and Muawiyah radiallahu anhu in Asham. Muawiyah radiallahu anhu did not give bay'ah to Ali for six years until he avenges the blood of Uthman. Still they could not get to them. So Al-Hasan radiallahu anhu, one day when he was a young boy, when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was giving a khutbah, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would look at the people and continue his khutbah, and he'd look down to Al-Hasan and Hussein. They were two young boys playing in the front of the masjid. He'd look at them, and then he'd look at the people, continue his khutbah, look at them. Then he couldn't hold it anymore. <clears throat> so he came down, and he held Al-Hasan, and he held Al-Hussein, and he kissed him on his lip. And then he went back up on the member and he said, Inna sayyid. This son of mine, and his grandson of mine, Al-Hasan, is a sayyid. He's a master, he's a leader. He said, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to make him a reason for why a great fitna between two Muslim armies would settle. And that was the time in where Al-Hasan radiallahu anhu, he went to Muawiyah and he said to him, okay, I agree and I go down from my right and I give you the responsibility of being Al-Khalifa well, Hassan ibn Ali radiallahu anhu gave bay'ah to Muawiyah radiallahu anhu and that was the prophecy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa being fulfilled. But Al-Hassan agreed with Muawiyah that if you, O Muawiyah, die and I'm still alive, I become the Khalifa straight after you. No problems. He agreed to that and this is يعني, what they agreed to. So Al-Hassan did not live long after that and uh, يعني, he was given uh, uh, by the people of Al-Kufa. You see, the people of Al-Kufa did not like what he did, even though Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam praised what he's going to do. The people of Al-Kufa always wanted the people of, uh, 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 يعني, uh, the family of Ali. They wanted the family of Ali to rule. That's always, that's what they wanted. So as a result, someone gave him poison to drink and he drank it. And over a few days, he began to cough. And he, and, and hatta he says, Al-Hasan radiallahu anhu, as one of the men would come to him to visit him, he said, I cough, I coughed a chunk of my liver out and I feel that I am dying. And I know that someone had يعني, given me poison to drink. Eventually, radiallahu anhu, he died in that manner and he died radiallahu anhu. Well, Hassan now, him and his father have been killed by the people of Al-Kufa. You could just imagine, Ahlu ghadrin wa khiyana, as they say. The people of Al-Kufa were people of deception, betrayal, lies, they would promise something and they would do something else. Now their story is going to come with Al-Husayn. <coughs> so after Al-Hasan radiallahu anhu died, just uh, now of course Muawiyah's rule went on for long, went on for almost 20, 21 years. Muawiyah radiallahu anhu remained in rule for a long time. Well, alhamdulillah, by that time, yani the Muslim matters had settled and it was good times. Things were going forward, back into Al-Jihad, back into conquering and opening the lands. Many lands were open. When Muawiyah anhu got towards the end of his life, he wrote in his wasiyah that I want Yazid ibn Muawiyah, Yazid is his son, to be the Khalifa after me. Oh, the, the believers and the companions we're speaking about, still there's many companions at the time, they rejected and they refused. No, don't do that. How can you do that? No one ever did this. From Nabi Sallallahu to Abu Bakr, to Umar, to Uthman, to Ali, to Hassan. No one ever wrote that his son is going to be a Khalifa. So they criticized him for it. And they said, don't do it. Because if you do it, we fear that every single time now a Khalifa rises, he's going to write that his son is supposed to be the Khalifa. And the Khilafah, how was it chosen? How was the methodology of the Khilafah chosen? Shura, bayn al muslimin It was a decision making among the top of the Muslims. So they said to Muawiyah, leave it. Just like Umar radiallahu anhu, you know, when Umar radiallahu anhu was dying, he put six or seven names to choose the Khalifa after him. And he purposely removed his son's name, Abdullah bin Umar. He did not want him to be part of it. So there cannot be any conflicting interest and so on. So Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, 
قدر الله ما شاء فعل. He wrote Yazid and he remained on this. And the companions are very upset and angry with this because there are so many people that are much more worthy than Yazid. Yazid at the time is only 30 years old. Well, there's Abdullah bin Umar from the great of the Sahaba. There's Al Hussein radiallahu anhu. There's Abu Sa'id al Khudri. There's Abu Musa al Ash'ari. There's Abdullah bin Abbas. So many companions. Uh, Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, he dies. And the Khilafah goes down to Yazid. And the people loved Muawiyah. So they're going to honor and respect that which he wrote. So many people were yani backing Yazid uh, uh, ibn Muawiyah. They backed him. And he became the Khalifa of the Muslims. Now, he, uh, Yazid, he had a governor. Now, now Yazid, when he became the Khalifa, he was 34 years old. That's his age, 34 years old. And the governor of al Medina, who is, is who? The governor of al Medina is Walid ibn Uqba. This guy was a, was a bit of a tough man, and he loved Yazid. And who lived in al Medina at the time? Al Hussein was in al Medina, happened to be in al Medina at the time, Al Hussein. And Abdullah ibn al Zubayr. Abdullah ibn al Zubayr. Al Zubayr is his father who got killed in the, uh, the, the war of the camel that we spoke about. So Al Hussein and Abdullah, uh, Al Hussein, and Abdullah ibn al Zubayr, they're in al Medina. The people of al Medina, they rush, they rush to the governor of al Medina. And they said to him, listen, pretty much the people of Al-Madina have given bay'ah to Yazid. But we feel like Abdullah and Al-Hussein, they're kind of against this and they're not going to give bay'ah to Yazid. So grab them to your palace and force them to give bay'ah. <coughs> so he went, uh, the governor of Al-Madina, and he called for them and they both came. Abdullah ibn, uh, Abdullah ibn Zubair, he said to the governor of Al-Madina, look, um, I will give bay'ah, but just give me some time. Tomorrow I'll give bay'ah. And Al Hussein he said to him, Listen, I don't like giving bay'ah in private. Wait for tomorrow and I'll give bay'ah in public. No problems. When the night came, Al Walid ibn Uqba he sent spies to the house of Abdullah ibn Zubair and the house of Al Hussein to see what they're going to plan. The spies stood there for a while before they got sick of it and they went home. And Al Hussein and Abdullah ibn Zubair had their rides ready. They got on their camels and they ran at night all the way towards Mecca because the governor of Mecca, hatta even subhanAllah, Allah Azza wa Jal, he says in the Quran, وَمَنْ دَخَلَهُ كَانَ آمِنًا Anyone who entered Mecca becomes safe and becomes tranquil and peaceful. And there's security in there. And the governor of Mecca wasn't as rigid in his thought as the governor of Al-Madina. He was easygoing. And he understood that a lot of companions there were against all this. And they don't want Yazid in there. So he provided space and accommodation for them, no problems. And he protected them from the harm of the people. So they entered now. Abdullah ibn Zubair haven't given, and, and Hussein ibn Ali have not given bay'ah to Yazid, and they're in Mecca. The people of Al Kufa now, huh, once again, they come into the story. They heard, ah, Al Hussein did not give bay'ah to Yazid. Perfect. No worries. Let's stand by his side, because the people of Al Kufa don't want Yazid anyway. Let's stand by his side, and let's promise him we'll give him the bay'ah and we'll fight with him. So they began to write letters after letters after letters and they sent it towards Mecca, towards Al Hussein. Letter after letter after letter is coming. Allahu Akbar. Yani some, of the, some of the historians would mention that they be, uh, more than 500 letters from Al Kufa were sent to Al Hussein saying to him, We heard the news, you did not give bay'ah to Yazid, come to us and we'll aid you, we'll support you, we'll fight with you. You're our new Khalifa, we'll give you the bay'ah. Allahu Akbar. Fa some narrations mention over 18,000 letters arrived. So Al Hussein wanted to make sure that this is actually real. So he sent Muslim ibn Aqil. Muslim ibn Aqil, he's related to Al Hussein and that's actually his cousin, Ibn Ammi. That's the, yani, he, he, the his, uh, Ibn Ammu, yani his cousin from his father's side. So he sent Muslim ibn Aqil, he goes to him, go to Kufa, check it out. Is the news true or someone's lying? So Muslim ibn Aqil, he heads towards Al Kufa. And as soon as he arrives there, he goes to the house of Hani ibn Urwa. And he stays in the house of Hani ibn Urwa. And he begins to go around the city of Al Kufa. Shoo, people, are you serious? You said that you wanted to give bay'at al Hussein? Yalla, bit by bit, a group of 10, a group of 100, up until 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. Allahu Akbar, a huge number said, yes, we're going to give al-bay'ah to Hussein. No worries. 
until it reached over 10,000 people that are ready to give in Bayat al Hussein. And who's the governor of Al Kufa at the time? Al Nu'man ibn Bashir from among the noble companions of Rasulullah. So some of the people that loved Yazid and wanted Yazid, of course, there are people like this. They rushed to Al Nu'man ibn Bashir to the palace and they said to him, Ya Nu'man, there are people in the city now, they are creating this kind of chaos. And they're agreeing that they'll give the bay'ah to Al Hussein and they're ready to entertain and welcome Al Hussein. So Nu'man ibn Bashir, he made it like he did it he. Well, no problems because he was with the same idea as well. So he ignored anyone that complained. So these people that loved Yazid and wanted Yazid in the room, they went to Asham to Yazid and they informed Yazid, this is what's happening in Kufa. Better check it out. It's going to get lost very soon. So what Yazid, what Yazid did, is that he sent a man by the name of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad was the governor of Al-Basra. Al-Basra is right next to the Kufa. So he said, he sent a message to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, go right now to Al-Kufa. And Nu'man ibn Bashir loses his job right now. And Al-Kufa is under your governance. So now join it. You, you're now the governor of Al-Basra or Al-Kufa. Take them two together. Then Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, as we're going to learn, this, is, this guy is an evil man. So he said, all right, no problems. And uh, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he entered into Al-Kufa at night. And he came and he had covered his face. Wants to see what's going on. <coughs> as he entered, the people began to say, Assalamu alaikum ya bint, ya ibn bint Rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum, the son of the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They're thinking it's an Hussain. Well, he's coming covered. Either now he has verified that this plan is a certain plan and they're going to overrule and they wanted to topple uh, يعني, Yazid. So he figured out that for himself, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. And he went and he went until he reached, because people don't know how an Hussein looks like. So Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he enters until he reached the palace and they remove an Nu'man ibn Bashir. And uh, now he's become the new governor. So what happens in the Dalik, um, it says here, دَخَلَ القصر ثم أرسل مولا له اسمه معقل. So then Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he wants to find out who's the main culprit. Who did all this? Who's instigated this entire thing? So he sent a man by the name of Maqal. And this guy Maqal, uh, his, his main job is to go and find out who began all this fitna inside of Al-Kufa. So Maqal goes, to the house of Hani ibn Urwa. Who's in the house of Hani ibn Urwa? Muslim ibn Aqil. Remember, Muslim ibn Aqil is who? He's the one that Al Hussein said to check out the issue. So, Maqil, this guy, he acts like he's a person from Hims. He acts like he's a person from Asham. And he's got 3,000 dinar with him. He goes to the house of Hani and he says, Oh, Hani, where is uh, Muslim ibn Aqil? He says to me, He's in my house. He says to him, Look, Tell him to deliver a message to Al Hussein that I have 3,000 dinar here in, in the aid of Al Hussein and we're here to support him and we're here to aid him. Yalla, let's go for it. All right, no worries. So, Hani, you know, he, he, he shares with this man some kind of secret information that Al Hussein is going to be on his way very soon and that this is what's going to happen. So, this man, Maqil, who's a spy obviously for Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he goes back to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and he reports that. Hani ibn Urwa has got a lot to do with this. He's got everything and he knows everything. So now, they don't know where Muslim ibn Aqil is. But they know that Hani is responsible to something. So Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he goes to the house of Hani ibn Urwa. And he takes this, uh, this servant with him, which is Maqil. They go to the house of Hani, knock on the door. Hani, where's Muslim ibn Aqil? He goes, I don't know. So he says to Maqil, do you recognize this man? So now Hani understood that that was a spy that was sent to him and he has been deceived. So he said to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he said, Wallahi, if Muslim ibn Aqil was under my foot, I would not raise it so that I expose him. Yani I'm not one of those that deceive and betray. Go. So he grabbed him and he, and he slapped him right there and he ordered him to be prisoned. So after this, Muslim ibn Aqil, he's in the house, he's hiding. He heard what Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad said and that they're after him. And obviously, they want to kill him now. So Muslim Ibn, Ibn Aqil, he sent out the message straight away to all the people of Al-Kufa that promised him that they'll give bay'ah to Al-Hussein. 
Yalla, come out in support. And let's go and uh, circle the, the palace of Ubaidullah bin Ziyad and let's go uh, topple Ubaidullah bin Ziyad. So 4,000 come out. Um, Muslim ibn Aqil is with them. And they all surround the house of Ubaidullah bin Ziyad. Ubaidullah bin Ziyad is, now, this is considered like, what's, what's happening right now? So he had people, he had the, yani, ministers in his palace. And he said, do something. Get rid of these people. So the minister started coming out and saying, oh people, go back to your homes and we'll give you money and we'll give you gifts and whatever you want, we'll do for you. So mothers started coming out of their house, taking their kids away. Fathers came out, taking their brothers out of this 4,000 that had circled the house of Ubaidullah bin Zid. Sure, you see the people of Al-Kufa out there? Towards Salat al-Asr, there was only about a thousand people left with Muslim ibn Aqil. And then the sun had set, Salat al-Maghrib had approached, and there was absolutely no one with Muslim ibn Aqil. He was the only one standing outside the palace of Ubaidullah bin Ziyad. So he realized what is going to happen. He's going to get caught. So he ran away from there. He ran in the streets of Al-Kufa until he reached the house of a woman. And he knocked the door and he said, please give me some water to drink. And it's been a long day and it's hot as well. So she said, who are you? He said, I'm Muslim ibn Aqil. And I came to make sure the path for al Hussein is ready. By then, by then, Muslim ibn Aqil had already sent a message to al Hussein, come out, everything is ready. So you can imagine, al Hussein, radiallahu anhu, has just left his house. We'll speak about what happened there. But to finish this story off here, so he went into this house and he said uh, to the lady, give me some water. She said, Ya Ahlan, yani you're from the household of the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She did not believe I have someone from the family of Ahlul Bayt. So she got him into the house and there was a room separate to her house. She put him in there and she gave him food and water and so on. And they were looking, Abdullah bin Ziyad, he sent people around to look for Muslim ibn Aqil. Eventually they found out where he is, 70 People came and from the army of Abdullah Ubaidullah bin Ziyad. They encircled the house of this lady. Muslim ibn Aqil, he came out. He began to fight. Khalas, he knew this is a life or death situation. He began to fight. He killed some, but he got arrested and he surrendered. They grabbed him and they took him to the palace of Ubaidullah bin Ziyad. Ubaidullah bin Ziyad, he said to him, he said to him, Ma Why have you rebelled like this? He said, because we've given our bay'ah to Hussein. He said, Ubaidullah, he said to him, Haven't you given Yazid the bay'ah? He said to him, no, we didn't give Yazid the bay'ah. He said, Inni qatiluk. Then I'm going to behead you right here. For he said, Da'ni usi. Let me give my wasiyah just before you kill me. He said to him, go, go ahead, give your wasiyah. And in the room, in the palace of Ubaidullah bin Ziyad, there was Umar ibn Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, who was related to Muslim ibn Aqil. He said to him, look, since he's a relative of mine, let me take him to the side and let me give him my wasiyah. No worries, go and give him your wasiyah. So he went to the side with Umar ibn Sa'ad and he began to give him wasiyah. And he said to him, please inform <coughs> Hussein to go back, not to come to Al-Kufa. The people of Al-Kufa killed his father, Ali, they were the cause of the death of his brother, Al-Hasan. They're about to kill me right now. These people, we cannot trust them on anything. They are not responsible. Rubbish. These people betray. These people deceive. These people lie. They're all after the dunya. All their promises are lies. All their promises are false. Tell him to go back to Mecca and not to come here. So, uh, Ubaidullah bin Ziyad, he heard this kind of advice. He grabbed Muslim and he killed him. رضي الله عنه وأرضاه مسلم بن عقيل من آل بيت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم and that was on the day of Arafah so you can imagine now the day of Arafah we're coming up towards the day of Ashura they killed him رضي الله عنه there and Al-Hussein doesn't know this he's got no idea Al-Hussein he left a day before one day before Muslim ibn Aqil's death he left Al-Madina Al-Makkah as he left Makkah a lot of the companions were against this because they knew who the people of Al-Kufa was. So Abdullah bin Abbas, by then he was an old man and he was blind. He seen al Hussein, and he said to al Hussein, Ya Hussein, la takhruj. He said, Wallahi, if I did not fear that the people will belittle me, I would have grabbed your head and your hair and pulled you back and made sure you did not go anyway. But I can't do it. Make your own decision. Don't go. Ibn Umar, Abdullah, the son of Umar, عنه, Abdullah ibn Umar, عنه, 
he finds out that Al Hussein has left to Mecca. So three days after, Abdullah bin Umar, he takes his camel and he rushes straight after Al Hussein. And he gets to Al Hussein and he says to him, Mila Ayn, where are you going? He says to him, Mila Al Kufa. He says, Are you serious? He says to him, Yeah, look at their letters. 500 of them. All of them are saying they'll give me the bow. Khalas, I'll go. He said to him, Don't believe. They killed your father. They killed your brother. And they're going to betray you as well. So uh, Al Hassan is saying to him, No, I'll go. Khalas, I've sent Muslim ibn Aqil. It seems to be that the matter is fine. And, and, and Muslim ibn Aqil, because before his death, he had sent, come out. He told Al Hussein, come out. But now the death of Muslim ibn Aqil hasn't reached Al Hussein yet. So Subhanallah, Umar radiallahu, Ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Umar, he said to him, listen, inni muhaddithuka haditha. Let me tell you something. Jibreel alayhi salam once came to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa death. And he gave him the choice between staying alive in this dunya or going to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa chose the hereafter, Walam yurid the dunya, he did not want this worldly life. And you, O oh Hussein, you are part of the family and the household of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wallahi la yulhi, wallahi la, ya, wallahi la yaliha ahadun minkum abada. He said, by Allah, you people aren't for this dunya. You people aren't for this dunya. وَمَا صَرَفَ اللَّهُ عَنْكُمْ إِلَّا لِلَّذِي هُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ Allah Azzawajal had deterred this entire thing because there's goodness in you people. Allah doesn't want you to be the Khalifa, khalas. فَأَبَ Hussein. Hussein refused. He did not want to go back to Mecca. Khalas, he's going to Al-Kufa. فَعَبْدُ bin Umar رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنُهُ He hugged him and he cried and he said to him, أَسْتَوْدِعُكَ اللَّهَ مِنْ قَتِيلٍ Khalas, that's it. يعني, I know that you're going to die. May Allah be with you. أَسْتَوْدِعُكَ اللَّهَ مِنْ قَتِيلٍ Abdullah ibn Zubayr رضي الله عنه, the same thing. He said from the big Sahaba, all of them were against Al Hussein leaving Mecca to go in Kufa. And he said to Al Hussein, where are you going? He says, I'm going. He goes, are you going to a people that killed your father and killed your brother? Don't go. Al Hussein also refused and he went. Wa Abu Sa'id Al Khudri as well, he gave him advice. Wal-Farazdaq al-Sha'ir, he met him on the way and he gave him advice. Everyone had given Al Hussein advice, don't go. Anyway, Al Hussein radiallahu anhu continues to his path to Al Kufa. As he's on the way, news arrives. Because remember that person that Muslim ibn Aqil gave advice to? What was his name? His name was Umar ibn Sa'ad. He had sent his messenger out to Al Hussein to give him the news that Muslim ibn Aqil died and go back. So he meets Al Hussein on the road and he says to him, listen, stop. Muslim ibn Aqil says, go back. Actually, he has died. And the people of Al-Kufa are people of betrayal and denial. Go back. There's no goodness for you here. So al Hussein wanted to go back. But al Hussein had left Mecca with 73 family members. He's got babies, the wives, uh, his, his, uh, yani his nephews, which are Al-Hassan's uh, children, Ali radiallahu anhu's children, which are his other brothers from another mother. 73. They're not going for war. These people are going to take the rulership and to become Khulafa and become Khalifa in Al-Kufa. So they're not ready for war. So that's how they're going. So when this man, he said to Hussein, that Muslim ibn Aqil is dead, go back. Al-Hussein wants to go back. He looked at the family and from among the family are the children of Muslim ibn Aqil. They said, no way. If they had killed our father, let's go and avenge the death of our father. We're not going back. So Hussein said, all right, of course, let's go. But Sir Hussein wanted to return. Anhu wa we wish he had went back. And the children, you can understand, their father have just been killed. So they said, no way we're turning back. Let's go and fight the people of Al-Kufa. Yani in other words, we'll, we'll gather up these people that gave us the bay'ah, we'll gather up with us, and then we'll fight those people that are responsible. That's what they're thinking. Fa subhanallah, they're on the way, they're marching, and as they're marching, Abdullah bin Ziyad, he sent someone by the name of Hur ibn Yazid. He sent him with an army of a thousand people. He sent him out to Al Hussein with a direct message. Listen, don't come here. Go, go somewhere else. That's who Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad is sending to Al Hussein, go back. For they get to him and they say to him, uh, they say to him, look, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, the governor, he's just killed Muslim, go back. It's better for you. 
فال حسين he refused and he kept يعني ignoring الحر بن يزيد and walking forward فذين الحسين he said to him ابتعد عني ثقيلتك أمك because الحر began to cut the way of al Hussein he's getting in his way so he said to him move away from me may your mother lose you فال حر بن يزيد he said to him والله if someone other than you had told me that I would have killed him and I would have killed his mother but how can I do that and how can I say anything to you when your mother is سيدة نساء العالمين that your mother is the master of نساء العالمين which is فاطمة رضي الله عنها so he left him and they begin to walk al Hurra bin Yazid with his army of a thousand that Ubaidullah bin Ziyad has sent they're marching alongside with al Hassan Hussein and the family of al Hussein until they reach a land when they reach this land al Hussein he stops there and he asks ما هذه what's this land that we're in for they said to him Karbala for he said to them Karbun wa bala he said to them Karbun wa bala Karbun يعني a difficulty وبلاء أهاجب أنا تراو إن كلامي سبحان الله that's exactly where he's going to get killed رضي الله عنه. so once this has happened الحر بن يزيد يعني under this intense situation he doesn't know what to do. what am I يعني أنا what's required from me is that if الحسين doesn't return I'm supposed to fight him. that's the orders. ال ال الحر بن يزيد refused this. he goes if I make this choice, I'm making a choice between the hellfire and the paradise. So he decided to join Al Hussein radiallahu anhu. He decided to be from among him. Now, Ubaidullah bin Ziyad, he sent uh, Umar ibn Sa'd. Remember Umar ibn Sa'd, that man. He sent him out with an army of 4,000. Go again, once again, tell Al Hussein, go back and don't come here. Fa Umar ibn Sa'd, he gets to Karbala. And he meets Al Hussein right there and he says to him, Go back. For now, Al Hussein kind of understood the, 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 the top is really serious. And what we're putting the people in is in a big chaos, and I have a family with me. So he said to him, Okay, listen, go. He, he's now saying to Umar ibn Sa'ad, Go back to uh, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and tell him I got three options. Number one, that you people. Leave me to go back to where I came from, either Mecca and Medina, I'll just live there and خلص, we'll forget everything. Or I will go directly to Yazid in Asham and I'll put my hand in his hand and we'll work together. These are the words of Al Hussein. Later on, we'll understand that Yazid did not order and command the death of Al Hussein. But we'll speak something about that. So he said to him, That's my second option. I'll, I'll just go head straight to Asham and I'll sort it out. And my third option is, let me just find one of the armies of the Muslims that are committed to jihad and I'll spend the rest of my life with them preaching and teaching the deen of Allah and fighting for the sake of Allah and I'll die that way. But three options. No worries. Umar ibn Sa'ad went back to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and he said to him, these are the options. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he said, good, a good options, no worries. Yalla, tell him to choose what he wants and do it. But there is a person in the palace with Ubaidullah bin Ziyad. His name is Shamr ibn Viljoshan. This man is an evil man. He said to him, Ya Ubaidullah bin Ziyad, how do you accept that? You are going to be dictated by what he says and you're the governor? That belittles you. It's a humiliation for you. Rather go and arrest Al Hussein, make him surrender Al Hussein, bring him to the palace, then tell him what you want. So that now he's a prisoner between your hand, then you can give him what judgment he wants. And that way, ah, it's uplifting for you. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he was deceived by these words. And he said to him, hatta yanzila ala hukmi. Yes, I want him to go under my commandment and under my judgment and under my rule. So Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he sent Shamr ibn Dhiljoshan because he realized that Shamr, this guy is ready for war. This guy doesn't care. So he's going all out for it. So he sent him and he went to Al-Hurra bin Yazid and he seen him there. He said, Wayhaq, what are you doing? We sent you here so you can fight and stop al Hussein. You became part of his army. And that's when he said to him, look, I gave myself a choice between the hellfire and the paradise. So I chose to be with the army of al Hussein." And uh, Umar ibn Sa'ad, he said to Shamar, he goes, listen, if you do not, if you do not get al Hussein to surrender, you're out. You're no longer the commander and I'll be the commander of this army of 4,000. I'll take care of things. 
فعمر بن سعد he realized عمر بن سعد he loved the power he loved the position and so on he goes خلاص no worries we'll, we'll take care of it so at this moment سبحان الله شمر right now is there this is still in كربلاء we're getting close to the death رضي الله عنه شمر بن ذي الجوشن is there الحر بن يزيد is there وعمر بن سعد is there four thousand one thousand with al uh, Hussein Eventually, those with Al Hussein they leave Al Hussein once again. People of Karbala, people of uh, Al Kufa could not be trusted. They left him only 30 men with Al Hurra bin Yazid remain with Al Hussein. Al Hussein has got his family with him and they've encircled him right now. So, Al Hussein, he's angry. He comes out from the tents and he begins to speak words and he says, Oh, people, what's wrong with you? Go revise yourselves and hold yourself accountable. هل يصلح لكم قتال مثلي؟ يعني am I someone that you would want to raise your sword on and try to kill? وأنا بنت ابن نبيكم and I am the son of the daughter of your messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم وليس على وجه الأرض ابن بنت نبي غيري and there is not a single grandson of a messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم remaining on the face of this earth other than me. وقد قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم he's giving him a khutbah. وقد قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لي ولأخي النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم had said about me and my brother هذان سيدا شباب أهل الجنة that these people are the two leaders of the youth of the paradise وصار يحدثهم he began to speak to them and he's telling him leave the commandment of عبيد الله بن زياد this person he doesn't know what he's doing he's off his head عبيد الله بن زياد at that moment he's he's thirty four years old as we said oh يزيد over there is twenty six years old for you can understand يعني, the situation is very terrible. For, so, so, so what happens here is now it's Salat al-Dhuhr. When Hussein radiallahu anhu prays Salat al-Dhuhr. Just before he prayed, he said to them, Minna imam wa minkum imam. We have our own imam. يعني, the family of Rasulullah the family of Hussein, the 72 men that are with him, and the women and the children, we have our own imam. You people go pray by yourselves. They said, no, until you're our imam. Pray and we'll pray behind you. So they prayed Salat al-Dhuhr and they waited till Salat al-Asr. <laughs> By the time Salat al-Asr came and they prayed, <coughs> So eventually there was some noise happening outside the tents of Al-Husayn. Now him and his family are inside the tents. They hear some strange noise outside. So some people came out. Oof, what do you people want? They said, خلاص. Yani surrender. We want Al Hussein to surrender. Oh, oh Al Qital, or we're going to kill him. That's what Abu Dhabi and Ziyad is. It's going to happen. Yalla, very soon. Hatta, يعني, so, so in other words, they, يعني, they said, okay, wait, let us go back to Al Hussein in the tent and inform him of this. So they went back to Al Hussein and they said, Ya Hussein, surrender, or they're going to kill us. He said, Wallahi, I will not surrender. I will not surrender. Well, subhanallah, we need to understand something. Al Hassan, Al Hussein, radiallahu anhu, he was like that from the very beginning. When something was his, he would never drop down. Even when he was in Medina, and uh, Walid ibn Uqba was the governor of al Medina, there was a land that belonged to him. And he fought for his right, even though Walid ibn Uqba threatened to kill him. And he fought for his right, and eventually he got his land, and he got the land of others that also complained. And that's how he was in Hussein. He always stood for his right. For he said, La Allah, I will not surrender to this man, and let him do what they want. So they said, All right, we're going to come kill you, we're going to fight you. Fal Hussein, he said, all right, stop. Let me pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during this night. And this is the ninth of Muharram, the night of ninth of Muharram. Let me pray at night and uh, I'll make dua to Allah azza wa Faqam al Hussein radiallahu anhu praying in his tent where his family was also praying and they're asking Allah azza wa for forgiveness. Wa yastaghfiruh wa yad'uhu huwa wa man radiallahu anhum ajma'in. For they made dua and they spent the entire night in prayer. Now, the E61 of Al Hijrah, the day of Ashura, it was a Friday in the morning. The war began between Ubaidullah bin Ziyad's army, which the commander of them was Umar bin Sa'ad, and Shamr ibn Dhil Joshan is involved, and they began to fight with each other because يعني, uh, Al Hussein had a few with him. But Hussein is still no one, no one dared to come near him. So, يعني, some got killed and some are still alive. 13 from his family members are still alive. And they came and they circled Al Hussein. And they said to him, 
give up, surrender. And he said to them, I do not surrender. And they came and they're getting close. Who's going who's gonna to kill him? Who would dare to raise the sword on the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So as this is happening and he's walking and they're walking around him, we've got no idea what to do. Shamr ibn Dhil Joshan, he screams out, What are you people waiting for? Aqdimu, yalla, go ahead and start stabbing him, kill him. Fataqaddamu ila al-Husayn. So they came near him and the one that began was, his name was Anas ibn Sinan al naqi or Shamr ibn Dhil Joshan. They poked him first with the knife. When Husayn radiallahu anhu began to fight back, radiallahu anhu he was a warrior in all of his life. He began to fight. And they began to stab him until they stabbed him with their knife and their sword 34 times. And he fell onto the ground. And Hussein radiallahu anhu on the land of Al-Karbala. And that's when he died. Shamr ibn Dil Joshan after this, he came and he chopped the head of Al-Husayn radiallahu anhu. So he can show away the Lord Niziyad. So he can prove himself and get go up in the ranks and remove Umar ibn Sa'ad from his position. The people of Al-Kufa, that's how they were. Wanted wealth, position, money, gifts. Allah give them that. I didn't care who it was. Subhanallah. Fa, yani, hatta even later on in the time of Ibn Umar, later on, a people from the Kufa, they went and they seen, uh, they went and seen uh, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu. And they asked Ibn Umar, Ibn Umar, uh, is it allowed to kill a fly during the Ihram? He said to them, Anto, you're asking about the blood of a fly and the blood of the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa you did not care. He said to him, go and kill whoever you want. He got rid of him. These, these are how they, they were. And, and Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he said to them, I heard the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say about Al-Hasan and Hussein, huma rayhanatay ad-dunya. Yani, they are the, the, the beautiful smelling flowers of this world of life. This proved that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yani, when he used to hold them, he used to smell them sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Fa subhanallah, this was the death of al Hussein. His head was chopped. Shamr ibn Dil Joshan took the head and they went to uh, they went to they went to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and they showed him the head and he started panicking, shivering, worrying. What happened here? How did he get killed? And he began to regret it. And he had a stick with him. And he began to play with the lips of the head of Al Hussein radiallahu anhu. Wa Anas ibn Malik from among the Sahaba was in that palace and he said, Damn wayhak, move that stick away. For I had seen the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kiss those lips when he was young. And his matters were serious. So then, subhanallah, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and other culprits that got to do with this, they were all beheaded. And they were all killed for what they did to Hussein radiallahu anhu. Hatta it is mentioned in some narrations in Sahih al-Tirmidhi that when they were all beheaded and their heads were all placed in the palace, among them Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, uh, 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 some people would scream, Qajat, Qajat, it came, it came. They were speaking about a snake that had come into the palace. It went into the nose of Ubaidullah bin Ziyad and it came out from the other nose. And it went and it did that two, three times. Humiliation for Ubaidullah bin Ziyad because it was under his rule that this had happened and under his governance that this had happened. Now, what they hold against, uh, or, or, or yeah, basically after that, there are narrations that um, under the stones there was blood. And the sky began to rain blood and all of that in, in يعني, uh, the world was affected by al Hussein's death. But all of that is fabrication that did not happen. There was much better than al Hussein that got killed in an oppressive manner. And that never happened, right? Like Zakaria alayhi salam, or Yahya alayhi salam, they were beheaded. Their heads came off their bodies. And the, the sky never rained blood and يعني, under the rocks there were never blood. And that, yeah, all of that is something that is from fabrications. Well, what is a correct opinion here? Is that Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he says, then Ibn Abbas was in Mecca, he still doesn't know about this. He said, لَقَدْ رَأَيْتُ فِي الْمَنَامِ نِصْفَ النَّهَارِ of Ashura, As he was sleeping in the middle of the day, taking that midday nap, he saw in the dream in Mecca that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has a bottle in his hand and he's putting inside of it blood and he's going around. Ibn Abbas in the dream, he says to him, Ya Rasulullah, ma hadha? What's that? He says to him, "Damu al-Husayn wa ashabuhu lam azal atatabbaghu min thuliyom." This is the blood of al-Husayn and the blood of the companions and the relatives of al-Husayn. I am following it up until now, putting it in this bottle. Well, Subhanallah, uh, Ammar, the one that narrated this hadith, he said. So we investigated on that day, 
And we actually did find out that Al-Husayn radiallahu anhu died on that day when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man ra'ani fil manam faqad ra'ani. Whoever sees me in the dream, he has see, surely seen me. And it's a true dream. And there is no one more knowledgeable than Rasul, uh, about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam than Ibn Abbas. For Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he knows exactly how Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa looks like. Therefore, that dream was a true dream. Well, subhanallah, yani this, this is how Allah Azza wa Jal gave the news to the people of Mecca through, through that dream. Uh, subhanallah, this is how uh, Al Hussein was killed. So basically, those that, that killed him were Anas ibn Sinan al Nakhi and Shamar ibn Dil Jawshan. And yani what we remain with is one more thing, and that is to say that what we said at the beginning, and that is okay, this is a great calamity that had happened uh, to the Muslim Ummah at the time. And so our response and our reaction to this is to say inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon wa qaddar Allahu ma sha'a fa'al wa rahim Allahu al-Husayn wa radhi Allahu an al-Husayn and the family of al-Husayn and we do not go ahead and do what other sects do if the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as we said forbid to rip your shirts right and pull your hair if you, if you forbid that in terms of when you mourn uh, and, and mourn the death of, 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 uh, of someone that is loved let alone now ripping your actual body and bleeding it and, and so on. This is all not allowed. فَإِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَجِعُونَ This is what we say. And one final thing we say, what is our stance towards Yazid ibn Muawiyah? طبعاً Yazid ibn Muawiyah first and foremost, he's from at tabiin considered from at tabiin A tabii is someone who saw the Sahaba and he died upon Al-Islam. Now, there are, there are narrations about him that he never used to pray and he was a womanizer and he used to drink. Allahu alam, all of this, we got no proof of that. Even those that accused him of that, they were asked, did you see him drink? They said no. Well, how did you make up that thing against him? So our stance against Muawiyah, as, uh, as we have here, uh, 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 Yazid, sorry, our stance against, uh, uh, against Yazid, as a Dhahabi, rahimahullah, he says, لا نسبه ولا نحبه. We do not curse him, because at the end of the day, he's still a Muslim. Max, he's a Fasiq. Right? He's a fasiq, a rebeller, a corrupt person that يعني, caused chaos to a lot of the Muslims and to the issue of the Muslims. And he had known that Al Hussein was much more suited for this, but he did not give away the bay'ah. And he did not hold those responsible in Al Kufa, those that were responsible for the death of Al Hussein, they did not hold them accountable. يعني, things just moved on, right? Even though, Al -Hussein, uh, even though Yazid was affected by this, and he cried for nights after this. Yani, you have the grandson of Rasulullah just killed under your rule. That's a big musibah. And he took care of, of his family. And it was said that Hussein's head, it was said that it was said with those that remained from his family, about 13 of the women. They sent the 13 of the women with the head of Hussein back to Al Madinah. And that's where Hussein's head was buried in Al Baqi'ah. That's what Shaykh Al Sayyid Ibn Taymiyyah says. Otherwise, others would say that his body and his head most likely were buried in Karbala, where he died. So for Al Yazid, we do not, يعني, we don't curse him. Why? Because uh, the Muslim shouldn't curse. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, لَيْسَ الْمُسْلِمُ بِالسَّبَّابِ وَلَا بِالْلَّعَانِ A believer, it's not from his manners and his behavior and his attitude and his words that he curses and walks around and slanders people. Then we don't know. Did Yazid make a tawbah after this or not? This is between him and Allah Azza wa What we say, is that لا نسبه ولا نحبه and that's the end of our say uh, with Yazid that's the end of our say with Yazid نعم ف... and يعني, even, even this is the same opinion some of the ulama رحمهم الله would say this is the same opinion we have about uh, Shamr ibn Dil Jawshan and so on but they said Shamr the one that killed al Hussein, we hope for him Jahannam we hope for him Jahannam but if he had made a tawbah between him and Allah Azza wa Jal at the end of the day these people were Muslims all of them if the tawbah is accepted by Allah, this is a separate story. Otherwise, all of these people that cause this kind of chaos among the Muslims, all of them, uh, we do not like them, and we disassociate from what they did and their actions. Well, this is the end of the opinions uh, against them. Wallahu uh, a'lam. This comes to the end of the story. That was in brief. والله أعلم وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين